The, uh, the Tumi uh, instructional technique, uh, you really didn't know where he was going with, with what he was telling you what to do. He wouldn't explain it. He, he would say, well, you know, I want to have uh, your hand in a certain position. And he was trying to basically balance the sound between your hands as um, later, you know, he was thinking basically four to six months later when you would be playing roles and you'd be balancing your hands with your bones, with the bone masses. So the balance is from the weight of the bones. Well, he didn't tell you that. He was very concerned about getting you in front of, in front of a, a pane of glass where everybody was in front of a pane of glass, long 40 foot, 30 foot pane of glass so everybody could see everybody and getting all of the, the hand positions and everything in, in the proper uh, uh, physiology for the individual. Uh, you did not perform with sticks for your first four lessons or so with him. He took your sticks away and he, would, he wanted a certain, like Sturz, he wanted a certain position for your hands close to the body to limit the moment of inertia and to limit uh, uh, wastefulness. These guys did not like Muller's technique. If you did a Muller motion, uh, a wide sweeping motion with your arms, the rehearsal was immediately stopped. And he told you not what not to do. Nobody, in all my time, I was taught by Jay for seven years, and twice that happened. Uh, and the rehearsal was stopped, and you do not make that motion with your hands. You want a motion to the head like this. And what, what Tumi was, was teaching you was perfection. He was teaching you a grace note that was just a flick of the wrist. It was not in the Sturz realm. The Sturz realm was much higher for, for your grace notes. But when you get a bunch of individuals in the line just playing flat grace notes, and, and it took five or six months, but once you had that, the perfection started to happen. Other drum lines instructors would not do that. They would teach quote unquote musicianship and they'd work on dynamics early on in this man. Well, I asked Jay one time, you know, why don't we work on dynamics? And he said, well, for what? He said, if you can play triple forte, you can play triple piano. He said, we're not gonna waste time on that. And sure enough, when we got the music for the book, which was in, you know, maybe uh, late April or May or whatever, early May, got a competition in four weeks, we could already play the dynamics. All he said, all it was was, you know, okay, make this uh, a crescendo, you know, uh, singles thing. We could do it. The lines that, that didn't spend the time on basic technique and grace note technique, and his whole thing, of course, was uh, not to bounce. He didn't like a lot of bounce. Um, he, he would want to say, well, okay, uh, you know, we have, uh, he put his coat on the, on the, uh, table. He would say, you know, I want you to control your sticks. And so could you hear all the notes? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, if you can hear all the notes, that's Mr. Jay Toomey playing there. That's what Jay used to teach, to control. So you got all these people in the, in the rehearsal and he's, he's fixing each individual, somebody that has a long forearm, they're gonna have their elbow back a bit. Somebody has a short forearm, they move forward a bit. If they have a wrist hinge that doesn't move a lot, like the wrist hinges, some people do not have a good wrist hinge for drumming. While those people have talent for drumming, they have good coordination, but the wrist hinge is not, is not physiologically good for, the, for the, uh, the competition ranks. He would have you move your forearm more. There would still be wrist motion, but, but you'd have more of a forearm motion there. And that includes the left hand. Sometimes the left hinge was different. I've, I've seen, I mean, you learn from Jay to do this just by watching him teach so many different people. And there was always a rule for, for what he did. Long index finger, short index finger. Um, there's things that you tell people to do that have long fingers or shorter fingers. They know what to do. They figured this out. Moeller did not figure this out. You know, the, the, the war drummers did not figure this out. It was in the Sturt's Sons of Liberty realm that figured this out. And that was all thrown away when all the uh, master's degree and doctorate uh, musicians came in to make money 
off of the success of these men uh, in the Drum and Bugle Corps in the 1990s, after everything had already been, uh, uh, you know, after the reputation had been granted by the public, the paying public, at the U.S. Open, the Marion show that had thousands of people every year in the stands, the World Open, uh, the um, I think the American Open, the Butler, Pennsylvania show. There was all these national shows now that had come into existence because the cores were gaining an audience because of the t instructional techniques and excellence of the Toomeys, of the Les Parks, of the Bobby Thompsons, and all these cats that were out there, the Sturzes and the, the students of Sturz, the Frank Arsenals at Chicago Cavaliers. Uh, the excellence was this way way above the, the college uh, marching band. So the people came to see the drum corps and um, there was money to be made. And this all starts, that money, that those ticket sales all start with the Toomeys and the Bobbies and the Thompsons and, and uh, you know, them sitting here and showing you how to play a perdo at a very slow tempo. It all goes back to the basics. Their basics allow you to be an excellent musician on the field of competition. And that cannot be said of Moeller. That cannot be said of the war drummers. It only happened because of Sturtz and then the Sons of Liberty people. So the excellence comes from the physiology of changing the styles of six or seven snare drummers so that each snare drummer is actually playing a different style with a different motion, uh, a different, a different, uh, uh, maybe a slightly farther grip back on the stick for somebody who has a, a short wrist hinge. You you go back on the stick a bit. Little things that they would do phys you know, for the physiology of the individual that in the line, the whole line would look the same. You would swear the whole line was playing the same style. They weren't. If there were 10 snares, they'd play 10 different styles. But it looked like one. That was the excellence of Bobby Thompson and Jay Toomey. And they're the only ones that I've seen do it. Uh, the Cavaliers with Sturts, I think they did that too. Um, uh, but that, that's, that excellence is what went way past the college educators. That excellence is what made money for the drum corps because they could put on a competition, a show that nobody else could match. Yeah. Nobody could play like these guys and nobody could play like their students. And that's, that was that, that excellence of, of just basic instruction. Um, the colleges here in the United States did not teach. They didn't know what it was. They were 30 years behind us. They, they had no clue as to what was going on. Um, and the only reason they came in uh, to the art form was just because they knew they could make money. Because this ticket sales had already happened, that the reputation of the cores was, was sky high. Don't forget, when I was a child, if you were caught in a drum corps in high school, you were given a flunking mark. You were given an F, which means fail. They didn't want you in drum and bugle corps. Um, Today, if you say you're in a drum and bugle corps, that's your ticket to a to a uh, you know extra money for college or something. They they want that. Uh, the reputation of the corps didn't exist when I was in it. We made that reputation based on the Toomeys and the Thompsons and all these guys teaching their students how to do things nobody could do. So now the reputation exists. Now, if you're in a drum and bugle corps, you put that on your resume. Yeah, I marched with uh, Chicago Cavaliers. A, a guy at college looks at that and says, wow, you're a drum corps person. In my time, if you were in drum corps, they just said, no, we don't want that. So the excellence of their instruction allowed the arrangers to arrange music the colleges couldn't do. Little 15 and 16 year old kids could do things the colleges couldn't do. And the arrangements went sky high. There were drum corps, listen to CDs of some of the drum corps arrangements of the 60s and 70s. They're unbelievable. They're 20 years of anything in the colleges. Well, that's because of basic technique. That's, that's what happened. It, it was the basic technique of Sturz and the Sons of Liberty that happened that changed the ability to arrange for the chorus. The chorus could do arrangements. Nobody, there's a short story on this. Um, there was an orchestral conductor that came in to teach the Chicago Cavaliers. And um, he wrote the book for them. And what I was told by the members of the cavities, they said, yeah, he came in to, to write the show for us. And he was like a kid in a candy store. He couldn't believe he could write anything. And I talked to this guy. And he said, uh, um, yeah, I could write just about anything I wanted, that the kids could play it. That's, that's one hell of a compliment from an orchestral conductor to say, yeah, these 18-year-old these kids, they could play anything. 
I could write anything I want. That's because of basic technique, the technique that was not taught by the high school band director and was not taught in the colleges. The drum and bugle corps were teaching uh, those techniques.